Hi everybody, I'm here today with skiing legend Wayne Barn. He's been kind enough to sit with me and uh, shoot the breeze a little bit about the early days of freestyle skiing and what it's evolved into in today's uh, slope style and so forth. So, Wayne, uh, as I know we were talking earlier about uh, the fact that a lot of this started at Waterville, I believe it was in 1971. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like in those early days to, to produce an event and just even have it? Wow. You know, it, uh, let, let's back up just a little bit how that all came about. Uh, Doug Pfeiffer, who was the editor uh, in Chief of Skate Magazine, had, they were at a dinner and Tommy Corcoran, who had just come off the Alpine Ski Team and the uh, U.S. Alpine Ski Team, and opened up Waterloo Valley. And they were having this discussion as who was the best skier on the mountain. Well, Tommy, being uh, you know an Olympian and a uh, Alpine ski racer, said, "Well, it's obviously the racers." And Doug Pfeiffer, who came from kind of a rebel ski instructor background, he said, "Tommy, I beg to differ with you because I know those guys that are skiing on the backside of the mountain, skiing clumps and jumping and stuff like that." And I said, "Well, Tommy, let, let's put together an event and really let's see who was the best guy on the mountain." And Tommy said, sure. So it was a great deal for Tommy to kind of feature Waterville Valley and host this event. And Ski Magazine got behind it. And I was a young 21-year-old kid at Vancouver City College. But I, I had a whole bunch of tricks on my sleeve that nobody had ever seen before that I learned on my own uh, that I was going to unleash at Waterville Valley in 1971. So anyways, for me, it wasn't so much about uh, winning an event as such, but just to come out to show people what could be done on skis and how much fun it could be, you know, doing these tricks. And uh, and the other part of it for me was, uh, you know, to see and be in the presence of my ski heroes, my legend guys that I go, well, Bobby Burns, who was infamous for the K2, you know, the red, white, blue skis, and Tommy Leroy and Herman Golner doing the flips off of court, so this cool water and stuff like that. There's guys to do it, right? Yeah, and I go, I, just to be in their presence, just walking around hanging out with those guys was going to be cool enough. But that's how a lot of people feel hanging out. With <laughs> yeah, I, 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 can, I can relate. Yeah. So uh, that first event, uh, it, it really evolved from a, um, a start gate and a finish gate on True Grit at Waterbury. And the very top part of the course was full of steep moles, and then kind of rolled in the middle section, and then kind of flattened out to the to the bottom finish area. It was, you know, the whole length of, of, of True Grit, if you've ever skied it, it's quite long. But uh, it was uh, the best two out of three runs to count. And uh, there was, I believe, four, I think I found the original start list in my scrapbook. You know, there's 44 competitors there. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty good. And uh, so, anyways, uh, I was fortunate to uh, take third place and win $1,000. That was a big deal back then. Mm -hmm. But at that event, it became very clear that uh, it should really be broken down to three disciplines. Uh, and that was when they realized that there was you know, mobile skiing. Good mobile skiers were guys that, who were very good in aerials, and there were guys that were good at trick and ballet skiing. So they said, oh, well, let's break it down into these three disciplines. And then we would also have a combined uh, trophy or whatever. So um, there were guys that came that couldn't ski, but could jump really well. There were guys that ski bumps who were like the ex racers and stuff, and racers that could ski bumps really well. And there were guys like myself that could just dabble and spin around on one ski. So that really kind of set the stage of the early days of freestyle, all the three disciplines that came. Very good. He's not familiar with the background of how that actually got yeah. started. It's a great story. Um, if we can fast forward 30 something years, um, I mean, today when you watch a slow style event, the size of the jumps, the backward maneuvers, I mean, the things they're doing are just crazy. It's really pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, and, and they do it so easily and effortlessly. Tell me a little bit about if, you know, how that, how you saw, saw that evolve from your perspective. I mean, I know from previous conversations with you that you were kind of impressed with how the sport has advanced. Oh, yeah. and, and tell, me, tell me a little bit. 
Sure. You know, like through my career at the competitive scene, we went through a whole transition because we were, really were professionals. We were amateurs, so we really weren't qualified to be Olympians at that time because at that time you pros weren't allowed to be an Olympian. So we kind of set the stage for the Olympians that competed in freestyle. Uh, and, and part of the reason that whole transition was there was also this uh, insurance issue back in the day where. You know, all of us freestyle, wacky guys were out there, and a bunch of guys got hurt. And so the skiers, you know, started to pull back and try to legitimize what they were doing. And, and as a result, to legitimize what we were doing, uh, uh, IOC uh, became involved, and freestyle skiing became a part of the uh, Olympic uh, venue. And uh, as that whole thing transitioned here, then it became this Olympic event. And we saw, I saw personally, you know, a transition of how the athletes became really true um, disciplinary uh, training. You know, for us, it was just going out and skiing and playing, having a good time. But, you know, when you started to represent your country or whatever, you know, on national teams, there was a lot more training. There was a lot more backed up from uh, you know, the USSA and whatever. So you became a real disciplined team, real disciplined guys in different aerials or moguls or ballet at that time. And so that became a whole deal. And then the, like, figure skating, the ILC would not recognize um, the ballet part because it became too subjective. You know, and the judges would like, yeah, and they didn't want to get into the same mess as uh, figure skating. And so they, that's why uh, ballet skiing never went beyond aerials and, and uh, mobile skiing because that they had good judging criteria. They could see a guy spin rotate with his hands or, you know, in the air. You could time the guys in the mobiles. They could, you know, watch how they perform the their aerials and the mobiles and how quick, you know, how they skied the line. So there, it was measurable. It was measurable, okay. So that's why um, there's no ballet skiing. Because the IOC didn't get behind it, it kind of just waited. Yeah, and I don't blame them because, you know, as you know, we watched so many Olympics where it was so controversial on the whole subjectivity of the judging. So fast forward now into what the young guys are doing. They really, uh, I think a lot of the kids, like kind of like what we would do, we kind of rebelled against the disciplinary. And so this, I think this is where the slope style came in and where the extreme skiing, where the guys were starting to jump in and really push the limits of what they could do on skis. And there were, there were natural half pipes and there were natural cornices and rolls where the guys were doing aerials and stuff like that. And then um, I remember saying, John, uh, JP Eau Claire, was starting to do these off axis twists on these big jumps. And then these rodeos and backwards twisting things you know, became kind of the new newing, new, new thing that the young guys wanted to try. And so I think as a result of that, this is where the whole slope style thing, big air, became uh, recognized as a, an actual discipline. And so from that, you, you see all these guys like David Weiss, uh, you know, and, and the half pipe and, and Sean uh, White and all these guys doing all these things. And, you know, they really pushed it now, and also, you know, the ski areas got behind it and built proper, safe, safer uh, venues for the athletes to perform it. I mean, when we built a jump, we just, oh, well, okay, we'll just build a jump right here, and you know, jump. But, you know, they've got it down to science. They know the exact amount of, you know, degrees, how much slope needs, how much fall away they need. Half pipes, they have the machines now, the big super pipes, they have it. And they know exactly what the shape of the half pipe has to be. So, as a result of that, it allowed the athletes to push the limits a little harder because everything was uh, uh, standardized, uniform, uniform. Yeah. So that they could practice and they could uh, train and well, okay, I can do this and do this. And so I think that's how that whole side of what we started evolved into what we're seeing today. It sounds like three dominating factors to me. The IOC got behind it. The, the mountains got behind it by standardizing the venues. And the competitors just have to outdo each other. That's the nature of competition, so the tricks got crazier. Yeah, they got tougher and tougher. And you know, like what we were doing, we were exploring all the time to push our limits, but our equipment really didn't allow us to do what the, the young athletes are doing today. 
So we, you know, we were kind of restricted, but we pushed the limits. And now the equipment has changed as well for the athletes today, and, and they could do different maneuvers, more difficult maneuvers than we did, which is why that sport is, you know, has such a great spectator uh, appeal. Because you go, wow, oh, look at that. You know, and it, as, as I look at it, I go, these kids are crazy. But it's really not crazy because they know what they're doing. They train and they practice it. And it's all about pushing your, uh, your own uh, uh, ability level and seeing what you can actually do on, you know, uh, use the snow equipment. Well, thank you for uh, talking to us today. Appreciate your My unique pleasure, Dave. Glad to be with you again, Dave. Uh, I enjoyed that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.